good mix of people from all over and we have more pouring in, uh, but let's get started in the interest of time. Um, thank you all for taking the time today to join us today in this session. Um, looks like today we are getting bombarded with a lot of data and we are trying to get a lot of knowledge out of this information. So the very first thing is to make sure that this data that we are trying to play with to, to gather this information, we want to make sure that we're looking at good data. And that's what all of this is about, right? We want to make sure uh, this data is good in all different forms. And that's what the topic for today is going to cover. All right. Um, so let's get started. Uh, let's just introduce ourselves really quickly. Uh, Datamatica is a leader in data warehousing and ETL modernization. Uh, it has over a decade of experience in uh, modernization and migration, and it's been trying to use uh, automation as far as possible to make this all very seamless. And helping us in this journey have been our unique birds, uh, our innovative birds, Eagle for planning and assessment, Raven for transformation and code conversion, and Pelican for validation. Right. Um, so. Uh, it's kind of giving the context for where we are coming in from today. Uh, myself, I'm Binoy Samuel. Um, I take great pleasure in moderating the session today. I'm an engineering manager for the Pelican product, so very close to the subject, and um, I'm here trying to bring in um, you know, the ideas that Deepak and Rohit bring in from all of you. Uh, for our host, we have Deepak, who is a co-founder and head of the product strategy and uh, go-to-market. Um, he'll be starting off the session today, and uh, helping him today is Rohit. Uh, Rohit is the product manager, and he spends a lot of time working with a lot of our customers, trying to understand their pain points, their challenges, and convert them into innovative features that can help manage the whole overall experience and make this whole process as easy as possible. All right, um, so let's take a quick look at the agenda. Uh, so briefly, we'll look at it as four different sessions. The very first part, we'll look at what is that data validation, uh, what is involved in data validation, what are the challenges there. The second part would look at the various validation approaches, how to, uh, how to plan for it. Uh, the third session, the third part to this, would be a demo of a validation tool. Uh, in this case, it's Pelican. That's what uh, we've been very closest to. That's what we've been working in on day and, uh, in and out. So we'll use that tool as um, as a, uh, as an example of an automation, as a tool that can help you in your uh, in your in the various cases that we're looking at. And the last part, we'll be looking at some of the real customer uh, cases, some real use cases, or uh, on where this comes about. Right. Uh, we do want to take some time and make sure that we hear from you too. So the very last session or the last part of this uh, would be a Q&A session. Uh, but as your moderator, uh, I want to make sure that I hear from all of you. So uh, although the mics are muted, uh, please uh, keep sending me uh, your questions. Scott, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, please feel free to use the chat. Uh, I'll be collecting the questions throughout. I'll try to... Um, ask the questions wherever possible, uh, whatever is left, uh, we'll take it at the end. Uh, and if we are not able to cover everything today, then we'll definitely uh, take it up uh, in an offline manner. All right. All right, um, Deepak, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Binay, for setting up this nicely. Hello, everyone. My name is Deepak. I'll be starting off uh, with the initial part of this webinar, and then uh, Rohit will get into the next level of details. So let's start. Why are we even talking about data validation? So every enterprise today, big, small, medium scale, is completely relying on the data to make decisions. And these decisions are in every aspect of the enterprise, every you know, business line of the enterprise. It is at most important that the quality of this data is of very, very high standard so that all these decisions are made with the correct data and directionally take the enterprise to profitability. 
be it customer insight, you know, what kind of customers you are targeting against, what are your customers uh, really buying, what kind of product line do they prefer, what kind of stores they do uh, go to, what kind of healthcare plan, uh, you know, they choose. So you need to have complete insights of your customer. Uh, think about your operations. Uh, if you have a supply chain, uh, you need to know if your inventory is enough so as to service uh, the very soon approaching holidays. Uh, do you want to replenish uh, your inventory? How do you want to go to market? How do you want to package your offerings? What customer segments do you want to target? How do you want to do your pricing of the product line? What kind of product you want to uh, really you know, invest on innovating? What do you want to you know, take to the market? Everything today comes from your data. All this will be correct provided you have a high quality data and this leads to your business growth. In the absence of this uh, data or the right kind of quality of this data, you are surely you know, getting a disappointed customer. Uh, take an example, I open my bank's website and try to look into my account detail and you know, get an incorrect number. This will really you know, take down the reputation of the bank. Compliance is another big uh, reason we need to you know, focus on quality. We have seen enough examples wherein regulators have put humongous fines on enterprises, big and small, and that has impacted bottom lines. So there are enough reasons to really you know, focus on uh, quality. And this quality has to be at every stage of the data cycle. Right, The moment the data is creating in the uh, systems, the point of sales, to the stage when data is curated, it has to be you know, processed and validated before you share the data. The quality needs to be checked for data in transit and at rest. If you are deleting the data, you need to ensure, uh, again, the validation that what got deleted versus what remains. So all this has to be repeatedly you know, checked at each stage uh, of the data lifecycle. Now, we all know that data quality is very, very important, but then it comes with its own challenges, its own intricacies, and we're going to touch upon a few. So data quality becomes a humongous challenge uh, because of various systems coming into play in any, any uh, you know, enterprise landscape. So data standardization, data validation uh, makes it a very big challenges. For example, you know, I may want to write it uh, as a postal code versus some other system may want to say uh, you know, the same thing as zip code. Uh, there are fields which uh, needs to you know, ensure that credit card details are always 16 digit, uh, but uh, you, know, you still get those errors. There are requirements when you want to anonymize your data. These are compliance requirements. Now, once you start doing that, you may end up using different technologies to anonymize. And we are talking about global enterprises, right? So this uh, anonymization brings a different degree of challenge in this validation. Data completeness, data consistencies are other dimensions. So people, you know, feel only partial personal detail or address details, which becomes a challenge when you want to clean your data. Data security and privacy is again a big pillar. Uh, there are you know, power users in all enterprises who have access to some limited sensitive data. Now, you know, how, do I, how do I validate this data when only some power users in the enterprise have access? So these are some of uh, intricacies uh, in validation. In this webinar, we're going to focus on data migration, validation in data migration programs and challenges. How do we equip ourselves to solve them? What kind of automation we can bring in? And some real world examples. Right, so let's talk about uh, migrations, right? So we are witnessing a huge cloud wave. So everybody wants to modernize their legacy and move to cloud. So people want to retire their Teradatas, their Oracles, NetEase, Hadoop, Data Stage, Informatica, 
you know, all these legacy workload and move to Google Cloud platforms, uh, you know, Azure or AWS. Now, this is not a very simple uh, modernization wherein, you know, you're moving from a small Teradata to a big Teradata, or you are, you know, upgrading a version. These are moving to net new technologies, and these systems are, legacy systems are built over decades. Uh, so these have huge complex workload, and these have huge amount of data. We are talking about petabyte scale of data. So volume brings uh, a big challenge to this uh, modernization, right? So we are talking about hundreds of petabytes of data. Uh, in some of the big programs we do, we are talking about maybe half a million data sets, tables and views, which needs to now be migrated to the modern data platform. Where IT uh, brings a different complexity. Uh, so since we are not moving across the same technology, for example, not moving a small terror, uh, oracle to a big oracle, we are moving potentially a oracle to a big query, right? So different systems created differently have different, you know, schematics and type systems. So uh, numeric in legacy uh, may be treated very differently in the modern data platform. So how do we how do we ensure that when we have, you know, uh, tens of petabytes of data and half a million data objects. How can we really look at two different system and ensure that all the data types are correct, all the formats are correct? So these are some of the challenges uh, you get into when you're talking about large scale modernization. Frequency adds cap cap uh, complexity to that. So you have streaming data coming in, you have batches, you have near real time. So any traditional approach of, uh, you know, doing a classical development and then giving it to the QA team may not work in these kind of a complex scenario. We have to find a way wherein, you know, we empower our dev team with technology in their hands so that they can do a parallel uh, QA and keep improving the quality of the code. So we need to uh, find a way to hit, you know, production like capability sooner rather than, you know, traditional waterfall kind of approach. Yeah, so manual, uh, you know, with the kind of challenges around volume, variety, and complexity, uh, standing up a QA army, even if you have, uh, you know, financial muscle and resource pools available, uh, the approach won't work. Uh, it is extremely tedious and orchestrating a 200 people QA team uh, really will not work. So the classical approach of, uh, you know, writing test cases uh, in the form of SQLs. Uh, so, you know, in front of you is uh, an example which comes from a production use case. So when we are talking about say 20, 30 odd data set, you know, it's pretty much possible to stand up a QA team and uh, you know, run these test cases. So write test cases, put them in a repository, create a small script to execute them in an automated fashion, capture the results, put them in you know, some kind of a uh, sheet, uh, and then start comparing them. So all this classical way of doing thing is possible when we are talking about 20, 30 um, tables or views. But the moment we talk about, you know, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of uh, data set, this won't work, right? And that's where uh, we need to think about automation. We need to think about some tooling capability which uh, can solve this problem in a cost-effective manner. Uh, one of the great advantage of bringing automation is, uh, you know, you will have confidence in your data. You are uh, not looking only at the sample, rather you are looking at, you know, potentially the entire production. So by having a classical QA team, you may want to, you know, validate only say 2% of the data, which may not be the right strategy, which may not give the right kind of confidence uh, to the business. The other big challenge of, uh, you know, doing it in a classical uh, way is, uh, you know, what does the QA team do? They write test cases, uh, they move data, uh, try to put it in one single system, and then write minus queries uh, to get the difference. Right, again, you know, in small 10, 15, 20 tables, that works. But the moment we talk about, uh, you know, hundreds of table and petabyte of uh, scale of data, 
moving data across network will never work. There are n number of reasons why this strategy may fail. One of them is uh, the moment you start moving data, you lose the data residency. So here we are talking about uh, you know, data centers moving to cloud. Uh, and you know, assume that these are across different uh, residencies. So your compliance, your security, CISO organization will come into play, and they may restrict you moving such humongous data across uh, to different tenants. Data privacy and data loss is again uh, a very big reason uh, not to move data across uh, systems. So you may have to think about a solution wherein you have to validate data across heterogeneous systems without moving the data. Security uh, of the data is again, uh, you know, one of the big challenge wherein you may not have access to the actual data. So you need to find a way to validate the data without uh, having access to the actual data. The other big challenges uh, with moving data is, uh, you know, potentially you may end up having a tremendous infrastructure cost, uh, you know, cost shooting up of storage, uh, querying. Uh, you may end up, uh, you know, putting tremendous load on your uh, existing production platform and, uh, you know, the pricing uh, will go up. Uh, the other big uh, bottleneck can be network. So you may end up choking the network if you are moving petabyte scale data for validation. So, you know, this all uh, challenges leads us uh, to the line of thought that we need some kind of automation, some kind of a product which can look across heterogeneous system and validate petabyte scale data uh, in a very rapid cost effective way. Yeah, so it Okay. Uh, so thank you, Deepak, for setting that context. Uh, hello, all. This is Rohit Kolhekar. Uh, I am the product manager for Pelican product. Um, so with that context, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how do you equip yourself for data validation? So, so data validation, uh, so basically the first step is you have to plan for your validation. Uh, when I say plan for your validation, it, it basically has two different uh, dimensions. So first dimension is you need to know your data better uh, so you can validate it in an uh, efficient manner. So that's come under the discovery. And then second thing is uh, you actually plan your uh, entire validation cycle. So what do you cover in the discovery? So basically, as I said, discovery is to know more about your data. So you need to uh, get an inventory of different things. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is an indicative list. Uh, so at least you know where to start with. Um, so in discovery, when you are looking at your databases, you need to know uh, the number of objects and the size of data that you are going to validate. Uh, you need to know how your metadata looks like. Uh, so what are your column types? What are your constraints, partitions, clustering? All that information you need to know. Uh, it's also important to know how your tables are connected with each other. So when your ETL pipeline runs, uh, what is the lineage between the tables which is followed to load your data within the pipeline? Another important thing is uh, different strategies. So how data is getting loaded into different tables? Uh, is it the turncate and load kind of tables? Are you loading incremental data? Are you doing inserts uh, only data? Uh, so that is one aspect. And the second aspect is how you are processing your data. So are you doing batch loading if you are doing streaming? So that is another uh, information that you need to have. The second dimension of discovery is platform. Uh, so encoding is a very critical uh, item to have information about. So what kind of encoding is used in your uh, existing platform and what kind of data encoding you are going to use in your target platform? Because this is going to tell you how uh, the platform is going to handle uh, specific data types. Another important thing is uh, how what is the resource availability that you have on the platform 
to do validation. So there are different aspects. So you need to know what window uh, you are get, going to get during the day to do your validation, uh, how many concurrent sessions you are going to get to do validation, what are the CPU cycles that you are going to get to do the validation. So all these go into uh, factor when you are going into the planning phase. The last dimension of it is the uh, data architecture. So basically, you need to know how is your data model. Um, so do you have SCD1 kind of tables, SCD2 kinds of tables? Um, what are your audit columns within those tables which you, you, you can use for validation? Um, the next uh, item is your org policies. So you need to know uh, certain policies like data retention policies. So this is going to help you decide uh, how much volume of data you are going to validate. So you might have 20 years worth of data, uh, but the retention policies ask you to only maintain five years worth of data. So you are going to do just validate that amount of data. Privacy is an, again another critical factor. So you need to know if there are there is a PII information uh, in your tables, how you are going to take care of it when you are going to validate it, are you going to encrypt that data uh, or are you going to de-identify that data? So all that you need to know. And the last one is, what is your migration approach? Uh, is it a lift and shift kind of a, mig a migration or it's a modernization? So you are going to change your data model. So these are some of the factors you need to consider in the discovery phase uh, to understand the scope of your uh, validation. And then when you actually come to planning, there are different dimensions you have to take into consideration. So basically, what time, what type of validation testing you are going to do? So for example, are you going to do developer testing followed by QA testing, then UAT, and then production validation, or you are going to skip one of these um, testing? So that's a decision you need to take as an organization. You need to decide. Uh, what are the validation scenarios you are going to cover? So how you are going to validate your historical data, how you are going to validate your incremental data, uh, how many consecutive runs you need to do to make sure that the incremental data is getting loaded correctly, uh, how you are going to validate uh, delta load versus uh, turncate and load kind of tables. So all you, all you need to decide on your validation scenarios. And the last thing is you need to write your test cases. Uh, that basically tells you who, in, who owns particular testing, what environment you are going to do testing, what is your entry exit criteria, what tools you are going to use. And then when you are test testing this done, what kind of documentation you are going to produce. Uh, so again, this is an overall uh, 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 discovery and planning uh, that we as an organization do and uh, this is a best practice that you should also follow uh, when planning for validation. So assuming that now you have gone through your discovery and planning phases and now you have actually started doing validation, there are multiple modes you can do validation. One of the best practice that we follow here in Datamatica is a, a parallel system approach. So the way we do data validation is uh, on the top, uh, you have your existing um, uh, EDW, Enterprise Data Warehouse, where data is getting loaded. In this case, Teradata is an example. So the best, best practice that we follow is we create a parallel environment. We call it as a production-like environment, and we create that on a, a cloud platform. Uh, and then we also do a data sync up between your existing platform and your cloud platform. And after that data sync, we use a validation method to ensure that your historical data is getting loaded correctly, your incremental data is getting loaded correctly. Uh, the benefit that we get uh, with such kind of a setup is basically because it's a production-like environment, so all your access control and everything is in place. So it's, it's as good as doing your validation in production. And second thing is when you are done with your validation, uh, you can just switch off uh, your system on the top and then make your production on the bottom line. Uh, so it becomes very seamless uh, to move from your current to, uh, to the new uh, platform.
so with this, uh, I'm going to spend some time on how we do validation or how our customers do validation. So as Binoy uh, alluded in the initial introduction, so Datamatica has different accelerators and one of the accelerators that we have uh, is called Pelican. Uh, so Pelican is a data validation tool. Um, and you will see that, uh, so we have gone through the intricacies that uh, Deepak has talked about and we have learned from our uh, challenges that we have faced and that's how that that is the philosophy that has gone into developing this particular product so you will see that we have tried to address all the challenges that deepak has walked you through um, so pelican uh, is a, a ai enabled uh, automated data validation and a reconciliation tool some of the features i will talk about quickly before getting into the tool actually so it's a zero coding requirement tool uh, so uh, we are not skill dependent. Uh, so anybody uh, who, who can use the tool is, is able to use it for validation. There is no coding required. It's a drag and drop kind of a tool. We have a comprehensive validation tool. So we have ways to validate complete tables, uh, incremental tables. Uh, one very critical feature that's in the middle is zero data movement. Uh, so in Pelican, we are able to validate tables between your existing EDW and your cloud platform without moving any data between the two platforms. Uh, and that becomes very critical. Uh, and we are also able to do this without using the actual data for validation. So we create fingerprints of that data and we use those fingerprints uh, to perform the validation. Uh, some of the other features is so it's it's uh, uh, so we have APIs exposed so we you can use this tool programmatically. Um, one critical feature uh, that I will show in demo is Pelican as a tool is lineage aware, uh, so you can do uh, your validation of your entire data pipeline in a single go. So you don't have to stop at a single table, but you can actually move on from a table validation to a pipeline validation. And it's it's an enterprise ready tool. So it goes into customers network. So we have all the bells and whistles built in to make sure that it, the tool gets through the security processes of any organization. So with that, I will uh, get into Pelican. Uh, so I'll okay. bring up that uh, interface. I uh, just wanted to point out that we are having a little trouble in getting the questions in. Um, but let me take this opportunity to ask a quick question while you're bringing up Pelican and getting it ready. Uh, and maybe Deepak, you can take that on. Uh, so when you're talking about validation, is the approach different if you're doing, let's say, modernization versus if you're doing a classic uh, lift and shift? Do you? Do you employ different strategies for each one of them, or are they all validation is validation is validation? Uh, yeah. Can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a good question, Benoit. So this always comes up, right? And customer wants to choose on a strategy, whether it's a lift and shift versus a modernize, right? So the way we define this modernization is your entire technology stack is being modernized. So yeah, you have an example, you have a table data as your warehouse database and you have your data stage uh, you know, as an EDL platform and then you have control M for orchestration and then your tableaus or uh, the reporting layer. Now, now when you're moving to uh, the cloud platforms, uh, be it uh, you know, Google with the data flow, Looker, BigQuery, or uh, you know, Azure, uh, Databricks, Synapse, ADF, Fabric now, uh, or uh, AWS, uh, you know, S3, Redshift, Athena. Uh, entire technology stack is being modernized, right? So you are ground up uh, creating this technology stack, and you are rewriting or translating the code through some transpiler into this. What we recommend very, very highly is, since you anyways are taking such a humongous and massive undertaking of uh, replatforming with a new technology stack, keep the data model similar. If not same, keep it similar. Don't uh, you know tweak a data model a whole lot. 
uh, because it will help you in multiple uh, phases. One, your uh, movement, uh, data movement, your transpilation become simpler. Uh, your validation will also be in control. Uh, when I say that keep your data model similar, you can always uh, you know, take the opportunity to bring in some basic uh, transformation. For example, you may have the notion of date today in legacy, but you want to do a timestamp, right? Uh, yes, absolutely, you should do that. You may not have any audit columns in uh, legacy today. You may want to bring a full-fledged audit framework uh, in the new platform, absolutely. We must uh, use this opportunity to do that. What we may not want to do in this uh, is, uh, you know, bring in new KPI or, you know, try to consolidate a lot of uh, uh, KPI. Uh, this uh, brings a different, uh, you know, dynamics to this modernization. We rather suggest that you complete your modernization, you know, get onto the cloud platform, retire your legacy and then in subsequent phases do optimization and consolidation of the data model uh, this makes it clean uh, simpler and you are able to really time box it rather than making it unpredictable bringing uh, you know risk uh, bringing cross functional steam into the play uh, and then kind of, uh, you know, essentially making the entire program unpredictable. So, you know, to answer your question, uh, left and shift is the way to go for data model. Rest of the technology uh, is getting modernized uh, and uh, use outcome-based validation. Okay. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Roy, back to you. And while Roy is uh, Getting started, just another uh, quick. If you look at the bottom uh, right of uh, those uh, little icons there, there is one uh, which is which has activities. Uh, so when you click on those activities, you should see an option for Q and A. Uh, seems like that uh, should allow you to open, uh, like ask some questions. Uh, so let's try that. Um, yeah. In the meantime, Rohit, please go ahead. Sorry. Sure. sure. Okay. So I think we're getting the echo. Hello. Okay. This good. Uh, so uh, so this is so I have logged into a uh, Pelican. Uh, so a uh, Pelican, as, as I said, it's a uh, automated uh, AI enabled tool. Um, and for Pelican, the unit of work uh, can either be a table or a pipeline. Uh, and Pelican uh, is able to do uh, auto discovery of your databases. So once we connect Pelican to a database, it is able to find all the tables within that database. And it is able to match those tables against your uh, modernized platform for validation. So what you see on the screen uh, is uh, basically different test cases. So for each table, Pelican creates a, a single test case uh, on its own. And uh, the user can use this test case to validate that table. So for example, in, in, in my first test case, uh, the test case is already created. You will see that user has executed this test case for a number of times and the user is able to see how the validation has gone for uh, each of the execution. Um, we also provide uh, reconciliation when your test case is executed. Uh, so the way we do it is basically we are able to tell you uh, your source and target table counts along with the counts of your mismatch rows, uh, missing rows and extra rows. Uh, along with this reconciliation, uh, for this particular test case, we are also able to show you the samples of mismatches, uh, which is a very critical feature. So you will see this, this particular test case, the table had uh, around 10 plus columns which had mismatches. And uh, the tool was able to identify all the columns uh, within a single iteration, and it was able to give 
uh, samples for each column. Uh, we can go a step further. Uh, so you will see that uh, in big enterprises, uh, uh, the business teams or the business analysts already knows what is a threshold of validation for a table or, a, or for a column. So say, for example, uh, for a column uh, which has a sales number, um, and I'm migrating that table to my modernized platform, a business can tell, okay, if, if the difference between the two tables uh, can be 1% or less, so Pelican can even uh, tell you uh, how much exact percent difference is ex uh, existing between the two columns. So we call this as a threshold validation. So that's, that's another uh, feature we offer, which is a very uh, powerful feature. Uh, I also mentioned about um, data pipeline validation. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, so the table that I'm going to show you uh, is a table from my curated layer. Uh, and when the user has ra ran that test case, the table has failed validation. Uh, now, as a user, I want to know that since my table was from a curated layer, uh, there might be 10 to 15 tables downstream, uh, might be in ODS layer, staging layer, uh, any one of which would have caused uh, my curated layer table to fail. So how do I find it? So we give a very cool visualization. So Pelican uh, doesn't uh, calculate the lineage, but it's lineage aware. So you can use any external tool to upload the lineage information. And then you can find out where in my data pipeline the validation is failing. So in, for example, here the bottom most table is my table from curated layer, which has failed. And now I'm going to dig down to see uh, at what stage in my data pipeline uh, the table has started failing. So I can keep on going uh, and see my entire data pipeline. Uh, the best practice we follow is we go back until we find everything green. And from there, we start triaging. So I can very safely say that here, when that the data is moving from this table to this table and this table, something has gone wrong in the code. So I can look at the code, fix it, and rerun my validation. So this comes in very handy when you're trying to do your data pipeline validation. Now I'm going to show you how we do the auto discovery. Uh, so again, the same uh, test case. So uh, we have something called as a mapping. Uh, so mapping is, is an automated way uh, Pelican establishes connectivity between a source and a target table at a column level. And I'm going to show you how that uh, connectivity looks like. So this is a mapping. Uh, everything has been automatically created by Pelican. So what Pelican has done, it's on my left-hand side, it's my source table, uh, say from Teradata. On my right-hand side, it's my target table, uh, say from a cloud platform. Uh, and, and Pelican is able to map the columns between the two tables uh, along with identifying uh, what are the data types of the, these columns. So you will see that we have something called as an auto-correction. So you will see this problem happening in all the migration or modernization uh, programs that uh, sometimes uh, the data types when moving over to new platforms are changed. Um, so in this case, on the left-hand side, uh, a date time format was used. Uh, moving on to uh, a cloud platform, it has been uh, changed to timestamp. So inherently, if you are going to validate this table, you will find that these two columns will not match. Uh, but Pelican was able to identify this mismatch, and then it is able to auto-correct on its own. So it has applied some expressions, uh, which will take care of the discrepancies that I talked about. Uh, what Pelican is also able to do is it is able to read the metadata uh, of the table and identify if there are any primary constraints defined. And it has automatically selected that as a base of validation. Uh, it also gives you a flexibility. So if you feel that this column alone is not unique enough, then it gives you an ability to select additional columns. So a combination of columns 
makes uh, it unique and it forms a uh, base of validation. Uh, we also give an option for incremental validation. So if you have a CD1, a CD2 types of tables where you have an audit column, say uh, load date, created date, which we want to use for incremental validation, uh, that can also be selected. Uh, we also give a um, flexibility to user to manage the scope of validation. So if you want to delete certain columns, uh, due to the fact that those are audit columns or those have PII information, you can delete those columns. And then you can also restrict the number of rows that you can validate using a filter option. So you can put complex filters using subqueries to restrict the scope of your validation. So this is a one-time uh, setup that the tool does it does on its own, and I'll I'll go through how how that is done. Uh, once this uh, mapping setup is done, uh, all the all that the user has to do is uh, create a scheduler. So basically, a scheduler is nothing but uh, we are telling the tool how I want to run my validation. So I'll I'll show you show an example. So what does go into scheduler? So Pelican offers uh, multiple modes of validation. So if you are looking for a quick check, you can use Litmus. If you are looking for a comprehensive check, go for a full validation. Uh, if you want to do uh, incremental validation, you can mention your incremental validation window uh, here uh, and do the incremental validation on the table. Uh, Pelican comes with uh, uh, inbuilt scheduler. Uh, so you can put your table on a particular recurrence of validation. Uh, and lastly, we also give an option of uh, alerts and notification. Uh, so you don't have to keep on watching your validation. You just submit your job, uh, go do your work, uh, and Pelican will notify you once the validation is completed. Uh, so it's as simple as that. You are all set to do validation. All I have to do is just uh, kickstart the validation and the tool will do the uh, rest of the job. Um, while the tool is running the validation, I'm just going to uh, show you how we create the mapping, which I talked about, and how Pelican is able to auto-discover. Um, so it's a simple process. Um, what we do is in Pelican, uh, so for example, if I'm going to use Teradata as my source, BigQuery as my target, I tell Pelican, what is my source and target? Uh, Pelican is able to identify the different databases on the Teradata side. Uh, I select my database where my table of interests are present. Uh, I, I also select uh, a similar uh, data set on BigQuery where my migrated tables are present. Uh, all you need to do is select your tables that you want to validate. So you can uh, select uh, everything uh, in a single go, um, or you can select table one by one. We also give an option of uh, equivalence file. Uh, so if you have your metadata of the tables available in an Excel or a CSV, we can take that as input, and you can do mapping for thousands of tables uh, in a single go. Um, all I have to do is at the bottom, I have to click on map and uh, Pelican do, will do the rest of the job. So I'm going to show you how uh, we do it for one of the tables. So I'm going to do a map. What Pelican is doing is it's going to the metadata of the table, reading the metadata, creating a map between source and target. You will also see that at no point I have mentioned what is my target table. Uh, so we have a couple of algorithms, uh, approximation threshold and phonetic match. Uh, so Pelican on its own uh, will find out uh, corresponding tables from your um, target platform. Uh, so that's how uh, simple it is to create the mapping. It is a one-time uh, setup uh, that we do. Uh, you don't have to do it uh, every time. Um, so, so this is a basic uh, working of Pelican. 
Uh, I, I mentioned it's an enterprise ready product. Uh, so we have a, a comprehensive user management module. So you can integrate Pelican with your Active Directory, uh, LDAP servers. We have a work segmentation concept. Uh, so you can divide the work and maintain access that way. Um, Pelican is a licensed uh, tool, so we provide a license. Uh, we have a code migration utility, uh, uh, so we can migrate seamlessly between one instance of Pelican to other. Um, and then, uh, so we you keep on coming with different features. Uh, so recently we have um, released a data profiling check feature. So this, this comes very handy to quickly check uh, how your metadata look like, uh, and then also do a uh, aggregate checks on your table, like some average, min, max. Uh, so it's a quick validation. But what I have shown is a cell level validation, uh, which is a very critical uh, step of the validation process. Um, I think uh, with this, a uh, short demo, I would like to go back to uh, So Rohit, uh, thanks for the demonstration of how to set up the, uh, the validation, how to plan for it, how to run it and look at the reports. So uh, before you go on to the next section, uh, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, raise two questions. Um, very related questions, one from Samay and one from Krishna. Um, first question is, um, and uh, you've kind of touched on it, but I just want to make sure that you address it once more, but um, can we use Pelican for architecting and configuring or replicating uh, the target environment? And the second related question from Krishna is, can Pelican migrate data as well, or is it just validation? Yeah, right, so I, I'll, I'll take that, Vinay. So Pelican is a, a validation uh, tool. So the role is to look at heterogeneous systems and tell you whether they are matching or not. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, Datamatica offer end-to-end -end modernization capability, and we have IPs for various uh, phases of the modernization uh, so Eagle is our assessment, planning, automation. Uh, we have a code conversion uh, technology, which is Raven. Uh, we also have uh, data movement automation. So we have data ingestion framework or Condor, and then Pelican is the automation. So in this webinar, we are focusing on data validation, but we support end-to-end -end modernization through our other IPs. And we will reach out to you, uh, Samay and Krishna, uh, and we can get into the other IPs on a different uh, session. Thank you. Uh, so, Binay, can I uh, go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, great. Uh, so, before I go on to uh, uh, the, the presentation, uh, the one thing I want to mention is, so whatever uh, I have covered so far in the tool is basically uh, how do I use Pelican for migration testing? Uh, the beauty of Pelican so is, is that uh, it's a very sticky product. So you don't just need to use it for migration testing, but you can keep using it beyond migration. Uh, and when I say use it beyond migration, so uh, you can use it for data monitoring. So we have a feature within Pelican where, where you can create your own SQLs uh, and then you validate those SQLs. Uh, so you can validate your uh, ETL pipelines. You can monitor how your data is moving uh, from table to table. Uh, you can also use this tool for uh, data availability monitoring. So in case of your DR testing or uh, in case of your data replication testing, uh, so you can use this tool to do uh, audits uh, for your DR testing. Um, so the way we use it is basically uh, actually in a DR situation or if you are doing an audit for DR situation, uh, 
the way we do it is uh, for an audit of a DR situ uh, situation, we usually get the data from the DR site into a non-production environment. And then we use Pelican to do validation between that non-production and the production environment. Uh, we can also use Pelican for regression testing. Uh, we can also use, uh, we have seen people using M uh, Pelican also for MDM testing. So it has uh, different use cases that it can serve. Uh, and we are certainly happy to talk about it in a separate session. But I just wanted to mention that uh, before I get into the final slides of the presentation. Okay. So with the tool, um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, quickly talk about some of the real use cases that we as an organization has uh, served uh, over the year. And so I'm going to talk about three use cases. Uh, so first use case uh, is about a US a retailer. Um, um, so their main use case was, so initially they were uh, planning to uh, do validation to their GCP migration using the army of QAs. Uh, and that's where we had stepped in and we had suggested uh, our tool as an alternative solution. Uh, the benefits that they realized at the end of the project was they were almost uh, able to save 95, 90% of the entire cost that they had initially uh, estimated. And they were also able to save uh, the cost of the uh, 25 engineers that they were initially planning to invest for this project. Uh, not to mention that they were able to decommission their existing enterprise data warehouse with a confidence. Uh, so this is one of the uh, use case. Another use case is we have is uh, for a healthcare, healthcare company. Uh, so they were on IBM Netiza, and again, they wanted to move uh, out of IBM Netiza. And uh, in their case, uh, the constraint was time. Uh, so they wanted to get uh, to a modernized platform within specific time. Uh, so the main factor for them was uh, scaling the validation. So they had to do all the validation with, with, within a very short amount of time. Um, so providing them a, a solution which can do parallel validation and which can do validation at a scale was very critical. Uh, and again, uh, we were able to uh, use uh, Pelican as a preferred product and then uh, help them uh, get this uh, use case achieved. So again, a 60% saving in time uh, that we had achieved. The last one is a BS, uh, BFSI giant uh, from India. Uh, so BFSI, again, is, is always stacked with uh, data security, data uh, privacy, uh, because they have critical user information. Um, and again, we use Pelican um, and the couple of the features that, that we have in Pelican is basically we do not use the actual data for validation and we use a very compressed uh, fingerprint of the data for validation. So those were the critical features uh, that we have utilized to uh, uh, get this particular use case uh, served uh, for this customer. I think I have come to the last section uh, of this presentation. So what we are saying is today we have seen uh, why we need data validation, what are the intricacies uh, in data validation, then we have seen how do we plan for data validation, how do uh, what are the approaches to do data validation. We have also seen a working tool um, uh, that we can use for validation. Uh, what I want to finish up with is a, a mindset. Uh, so what, what we have seen is people usually stop uh, validation or consider validation uh, when they are doing migration or when they are doing uh, modernization. Uh, so validation is not a one-time activity. Uh, it has to be in your DNA. It has to be part of your uh, operations process. 
uh, and that's what we are depicting in this slide that you should think about validation as a, uh, a life cycle. So at each point of your data, you have to put uh, efforts to do validation, uh, which are which is going to help you make sure that your data is accurate, your data is complete, your data is consistent, and uh, you are able to serve your business well with a uh, quality data. Uh, so I think with that, we have reached to the end of our presentation. I, I sincerely thank everybody for listening to us specially. Uh, Binay, over to you uh, for Q&A session. Sure, uh, thanks, Rohit. And uh, we have a few questions that have already come in. Uh, please do share your questions. Um, use the Q&A section under the activities icon to raise your questions. Um, so while folks are doing that, let me just work backwards. Um, and uh, Rohit, can you talk about deployment? Uh, where is Pelican deployed? Where is it hosted? Is it on a third party cloud? Is it on the customer's cloud? Is it on-prem? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Pelican is al always deployed in customer environment. Uh, it, it never comes out of customer environment. And uh, we have multiple models of deployment. Uh, so you can deploy Pelican uh, on-premise, you can deploy Pelican on cloud platforms. Uh, and within these two flavors, we offer multiple deployment options. So you can deploy on a standalone VM uh, with Docker or Podman, uh, or you can also use a Kubernetes cluster and deploy Pelican. Uh, so we have multiple models available. Uh, and Pelican comes with a one-click installation. So uh, as soon as you get the image of the tool on, on the machine, uh, it's a one-click installation uh, that we offer. All right. And um, you're across clouds, right? GCP, AWS, Azure. Yes. Yeah, we support all, all the platforms uh, and all the kind of databases. So both as source and target. So everything is supported by Pelican. Uh, we, in fact, uh, have recently come up with a new feature of uh, report validation. Uh, and uh, as Rohit mentioned, threshold. So this is something which came uh, in our recent release. So in addition to the uh, databases, we are now supporting file validations. We are supporting report validations. Sounds good. Um, so this kind of goes back to your question that um, uh, that what the use case about the BFSI, right, and about data security. Uh, so does Pelican store data in memory out anywhere outside of the customer on-prem database um, or on the cloud? Um, and related to that, how like does it or does it provide any capability for data encryption? Right. So two parts. One is is data stored anywhere uh, outside of the customer's database? And do you handle encryption? Yeah, good good question, Benai. So one of the primary architectural principle uh, for Pelican when we were designing it is we wanted to do everything local. Because, uh, you know, moving data will, uh, you know, cause your CISO to come in and ask questions. So we created an architecture which is essentially pushed down. So everything is local. So all your data resides locally, both in source and target all the time. The only thing which moves to Pelican is samples. So in case of mismatches, you want to see some samples. So only those samples move to Pelican, which uh, you see on uh, the Pelican UI, which Rohit showed during the demo. Everything remains local, secured in your database. That's one. Second, uh, even these samples are encrypted uh, within the Pelican Metastore. So entire metadata repository is encrypted. We also allow backup of this repository, and even that backup is encrypted. So data at rest, data at motion, 
uh, everything remains uh, secured all the time. And just to add to that, um, even with the samples, you do have the ability to um, allow different classes of users to have uh, visibility of that sample or not. So, and to the second part about uh, data encryption, does Pelican handle data encryption? How do you how do you work around that? So yeah, yeah. So, so data so, uh, data and data when you say data encryption, it means uh, you know, and how do we validate data which is encrypted at the source and target? So uh, you know, data generally are tokenized or encrypted through some salt which is uh, residing somewhere, uh, you know, in the enterprise. Uh, Pelican can communicate with your vault, get access uh, to that salt, uh, and encrypt the data in the runtime. And all this is done through some UDFs, which we will store in the database. Validate that, and uh, you know, uh, uh, just clean that up. So, provided that uh, Pelican is given access to that salt from the vault, uh, we will be able to. Uh, validate uh, the sensitive encrypted data. Now, this is, uh, you know, technically, which is feasible in uh, Pelican. What we have seen uh, generally in the customer implementation is uh, the users may want to remove these sensitive encrypted column out of the validation altogether. So Pelican has this ability to, uh, you know, prune the data both vertically and horizontally. What it means is, assume you have a 800 column table. Uh, and out of that, two columns are sensitive. So you may want to validate only 798 uh, through Pelican uh, and not give access to the salt. And then the other two column is some power user, SME who understand the data can, uh, you know, through samples uh, validate this. So these are the two approaches that can be used for validating data. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, we have a few questions around um, around the size of validation. So the first question from Ravi: um, How much time does it take to validate around one terabyte of data? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so again, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, as I mentioned uh, Bina, you may want to go on mute. Uh, there's some feedback. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as I mentioned, Pelican is designed as a pull down architecture, which means that, uh, you know, all the processing is pushed to your source and target uh, uh, database. Uh, so, what it means is everything is local. Uh, it also means that we are dependent on uh, the horsepower of source and uh, target to get the results in a specified time. Uh, having said that, in most of the production class uh, implementation, we see that uh, a terabyte data is validated in, you know, around between five to ten minutes. Uh, the way customer generally implement this is by creating a dedicated validation user and allowing them, uh, allowing this user a quota. So, for example, during your, uh, you know, peak. Uh, usage time, you want to give only 5% of the resources to Pelican versus a non-peak uh, time, you may want to give 25%. So, you know, it may finish in five minutes or it may finish in say 10 minutes or so. But yes, uh, it all it it is a factor of uh, the resource uh, you make uh, available. All right. Um, and uh, Follow-up question on that: What is the size of the largest validation program that you've successfully managed? So, what are we talking about in terms of the average size of validation, and what's the upper limit that uh, you've seen so far? Yeah. So, uh, technically, the software, uh, you know, if we size it properly, provide the right capacity, uh, potentially there is no limit to it. Uh, from my experience, and we have we run uh, Pelican in all our modernization projects, and at any point in time, we have say around twenty modernizations in flight. Uh, so we have tremendous experience uh, in modernization. Based on that, I have seen you know a pricing, a SKU pricing 
store wise table uh, which was around a petabyte uh, you know one single table getting validated by pelican uh, if we talk about the entire program we are talking about you know tens of uh, petabyte being validated uh, uh, by pelican so that's that's a huge table so uh, so tell me does it make sense to so if you have a petabyte of data or a terabyte of data does it make sense to validate everything does it make sense to validate all the rows or are you good with uh, you know looking at 10 tables like a random sample of you know 10 rows or like how do you how do you go about deciding what and how much to validate yeah good question again uh Binoy. so uh and again uh, you know you may have the right ammunition but you need to have a right strategy right so pelican is an amazing uh product to do the validation but you need uh you know experts to define the validation strategy now once you're talking about these huge uh table you you know with the kind of migration to give the right confidence. We may not want to tell business that we validated 5% of the data, please go ahead and start using this new system, right? We may want to go to them and tell them that 100% of the data was validated, everything is good, we are super confident, please uh, sunset the legacy, use this new system. So we should and we must uh, you know, target 100% validation uh but we must do it through automation and we must have a strategy so for historical you may want to validate once and whatever uh you know historical is done you may want to just spark it or something which is incremental that is uh something you may want to you know repeatedly vary so you may want to run pelican on the incremental data for weeks together uh you know to give uh uh confident to the business, but something which is historical, you may want to, you know, validate once and then uh, maybe, you know, once in a month or once in a quarter uh, to check it. So that's the strategy you should follow for really huge tables. So you're kind of um, differentiating between historical validation and incremental. So you're, you're uh, promoting a different strategy depending on what type of data it is. Um, so something that we've seen in some of our um, validations of some of our projects internal and external is that um, you know it's it's so easy to create mappings and to and to run validations that uh, sometimes you've seen hundreds of uh, tables getting validated day in and day out and sometimes it's the same table getting validated you know for weeks on ends uh, because it's easy to put a schedule on it and then walk away um, do you suggest a particular strategy on uh, we talked about you know do do you validate the whole table a part of it. Uh, so similarly, do you have a strategy for validating all the tables in the database or would you have a it depends answer? Like what's what's what would you recommend yeah. in terms of validation strategy for your overall database? Right. Yeah. So so validation and having the right validation strategy can make or break your uh, modernization. Uh, so, you know, one of the best practices uh, recommended by Datamatica is look at your serving layer first. So don't start randomly validating everything. You may have, you know, for example, you know, I mentioned in one of the program which we are doing, we are talking about half a million data set, uh, right? So we need to be very focused on how do we validate. So we should focus on the consumption layer, the serving layer, if the serving layer is all good uh, and pelican says that both your legacy and the new systems are matching it implies that the pipeline which is uh, you know loading these serving layer are all good it means that all the code base and all the tables and views participating in this pipeline are good and that's the reason your serving layer is good so that has to be by de facto, uh, you know, the first phase uh, of the validation. So the first pass should be consumption layer. Now, in case your serving layer, you know, some say, few tables of the serving layer turned out to be not matching with the legacy. That's when you start, uh, you know, moving left one at a time. So uh, remember, uh, Rohit showed you that lineage uh, on the tools. So, you look at the serving layer, uh, you click on that uh, table which is not matching and keep going left 
until you find the table which is all matching. Now the code which is taking data from uh, the first all matching table to uh, the first table which has mismatches is potentially you know the culprit. So and then focus on that particular code. You also have all the columns which have mismatches. You have sample of the records with mismatches. With all this, you will be able to accelerate your triage. So you know that's the strategy. Look at serving layer first. Keep going left, and uh, do that through the lineage available in Pelican. Great. So if I if I was to summarize this, you're basically saying find the lineage uh walk from the serving layer backwards um if everything is good at the serving layer you're great you're good to go you don't have to go all the way backwards but if you see that there is an issue with the serving layer then you work backwards so basically you're looking at a triaging uh scenario uh find walk backwards until you find which layer is green or which is red and then take it from there so uh, i guess you have good lineage feed it into pelican uh you can save on some uh, computation power. Or on the flip side, if you don't have a lineage, then your, uh, you know, the strategy is to test everything. Uh, lack of uh, a good planning at the beginning of that. Great. Um, let's take a quick look at time, and I think we can take a couple of more questions. Um, we have a summary. I think we'll have to get. Uh, some information out to you. Um, and I think we'll do this to uh, we'll share some more information to all the participants in terms of uh, some more of the features about the licensing and costing. Um, unless people, you want to take on uh, anything about licensing and costing right now? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, a license-based model. We are available on all the marketplace. Uh, so you can you know, go to the marketplace, find Pelican, uh, and uh, you will have all the offers available there uh, with all the pricing details. Uh, you can do the entire fulfillment from uh, the marketplace, which means that you can find us there. You can select uh, a particular offering of the Pelican uh, and you can you know subscribe for it pay for it subscribe for it and then we will connect you uh, uh you know to the team uh, which will help you in deployment so all those things are available we have uh, three tiers uh, one is a uh, try and buy tier uh, and rohit you can bring that up if you have this slide so while rohit brings that up uh, we have a try and buy tier uh, which can uh, help you quickly look at uh, this tool um, and get your hand uh, dirty. Uh, post that, we have a standard uh, tier, uh, which a small enterprise may want to use. And then we have an enterprise uh, a tier with all the you know, rings and bells. Uh, these are also priced uh, very, very aggressively. So we are talking about uh, you know, a six thousand US dollar for a standard tier, and for enterprise tier, uh, please reach out to us. Thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Rohit. Um, okay, so we're looking at enterprise standard and the try and buy tiers. Great. Right, um, folks on the line, uh, please do use the Q&A section to ask your questions. Um, I think I have one other question here. So while I'm uh, asking that question, please go ahead and uh, type in your questions or uh, feel free to send in a mail to sales.pelican at datamedica.com. Um, so one question that I have here uh, is, how do you manage validation with low or no impact to the existing production environment? You had mentioned during uh, one of the previous slides that uh, all the processing hap happens on the source and the target environment. Um, but assuming that you are in a parallel mode where your source is still being used or your target is still being uh, is starting to be used for some you know other retail processing or whatever, how do you uh, how do you manage it so that uh, the validation is not adversely affecting uh, the day-to-day -day production environment. 
All right, a great question. So uh, we have a push down architecture, which means that uh, we are pushing the processing to source and database, which you know brings some load uh, to uh, the production uh, which is being used currently. Uh, and there are multi prong approach to solve this. One is uh, you know create a dedicated user for Pelican and cap it through a quota. So you know in a peak time provide uh, say one to five percent quota during the non-peak time uh, you know give more so that you can uh, validate more and faster uh, the other approach which uh, we see a lot of customer using is go against a backup environment so generally you have a business copy of these uh, production environment right so don't go against the primary go against uh, the backup uh, which is most of the time in sync. Uh, please understand that your, uh, uh, you know, data ingestion and the processing uh, can be ha can have a characteristic of a stream, but your validation can always be uh, back. So you may not want to validate uh, the moment data arrived. You can always uh, do validations against the backup system, and you can always validate something which is say, an hour old or a day old. You know, today minus one, uh, so on. Uh, the other uh, way uh, we have seen people using is uh, maybe creating a temp cluster. Uh, something like a Hadoop cluster and moving uh, data to it, and then uh, validating that against uh, say a big query or a data break uh, or a redshift. So these are uh, multiple approaches uh, we can use uh, to validate data by putting limited load on uh, your existing uh, production. Right. Thanks, Deepak. Uh, we have one more question. Um, we have a time for a couple of questions. Um, so the question is, um, looks and looks like uh, someone's been trying out uh, the try and buy license. Can we run a litmus test on the entire table first, taking just a short time to run, and only do cell level validation if the litmus test fails? So I think that's a great question. Um, Rohit Deepak, who wants to take on that question? All right. Yep. Uh, so what I think I talked about a few other features towards the end of my demo. Uh, so the way we usually follow the best practice is we have a profiling feature. So we run the profiling feature first, which tells us uh, in a very quick way uh, if there are any challenges with the metadata of the table or if there are any challenges that we are able to see at the aggregate level functions when we run execute on the table. So min, max, average, those kind of functions. Once we do that, uh, we get into litmus mode. So litmus mode tells you if the entire table is matching. Uh, and then if you see that in litmus mode, the table is not matching, then, then we go on to the comprehensive mode where we get the samples of mismatches. So that's how uh, are the best practices that we usually follow uh, while using the tool. Thanks, Ruth. I think that answers that. I think we have a few more minutes. Um, Please do ask your questions. All right, so. Okay. There's a follow up question on that. Does the litmus test use less cpu than the comprehensive one yes yes all right so i guess the profiling litmus and then finally uh, the comprehensive one uh, do take progressively more uh, cpu processing and hence the strategy to go in that order perfect all right
Great. Uh, we'll keep the lines open for a little bit longer. Um, but thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining the session. Um, we do have a sales.pelican at datamatica.com email address out there. Uh, please use that to ask any questions that you have. Uh, so something might strike you later on when you're thinking more about uh, the scenarios that you're facing. Uh, so feel free to uh, send us a mail, give us a call, um, and we would love to continue the discussion further. There are a couple of questions, and I think Scott's left, but uh, uh, we do have a, a few follow-ups on our hands. Um, in general, what we would be doing after, after this, we would be reaching out to you um, with any questions that you have and also a, a summary of the questions uh, and any, uh, any additional information that we can get out to you. Uh, so... Uh, to expect uh, a follow-up in the next few days. Um, so while while we get that ready out to you, uh, again, feel free to ask any questions that you have. Uh, the lines are going to remain open for a few more uh, minutes. Um, but again, thank you for being a part of this session. Um, you've been a great audience. And thanks, Rohit and, and Deepak, for taking us um, through, through the session. Um, I guess there's more to validation just than just comparing two tables, right? Um, I think we've been talking more about the planning part of it, the strategy part about how to go about validation and how to get ready for the validation uh, than actually comparing the two tables, right? Whether it's fingerprinting or, or sampling or how. Um, so a great session, a um, lot of good information from planning, from validation, um, reporting, um, everything that goes to make a successful uh, validation, you know, and have the proof for the validation. So, thank you. Any any last words, uh, Deepak, uh, before we before we close down? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Uh, as I mentioned, that in large scale modernization, validation is often uh, underestimated and uh, unappreciated, and I've seen a lot of programs overrunning budget schedule because of this. Uh, you need to have uh, automation first strategy throughout the modernization, definitely in uh, validation. And Pelican is a fantastic technology uh, which helps you do that. Uh, please uh, reach out to us if you need a follow-up or a deep dive uh, on a particular feature. We would be more than happy to work with you uh, to answer your question, help uh, you with uh, creating the validation strategy and uh, the entire make your you know, modernization successful. Thank you, uh, Binay, for moderating this and thank you, uh, Rohit, for a great session. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.